Hi, everyone. My name is Mercedes Moffitt, and I am the Extension Educator for um, University of Minnesota Extension and Ag Food and Natural Resources located up in Carleton County. Today, we are going to be learning about poultry for beginners. Um, I guess let me share my screen here and we can get started. All right, so everyone should be seeing my screen now. Um, so, yep, this is poultry for beginners, an introduction to basic care of broilers, layers, or other domestic poultry. So I wanna say a giant thank you to our sponsor, Wittis Feed and Farm Supply. Um, without them, this would not be possible. So thank you to them. Before we even get into any of the basics about chickens, I want to make sure that I point out that you need to be checking with your local zoning authority. So every zoning authority is probably going to have different regulations regarding poultry about having them within the area. So for example, I have the city of Cloquet here, um, which is a city located within Carleton County. And so they have that you can have up to five chickens, but they must be laying hens. And uh, roosters are not allowed, so that's something else to keep in mind. And they may be kept in all residential districts as an accessory use, but each district will have specific requirements. And because of that, that's why it's really important that you're reaching out to your local zoning authority, because it's better to find out beforehand what you can or can't have until it's too late. All right, so now let's get into why raise poultry. So. I would say if you are looking into getting livestock of any sort at all, poultry, specifically chickens, is the best way to dip your toe. They are relatively low maintenance. They don't take up a lot of space. Really a pretty great thing to start off with. The other thing is perhaps you are looking to raise some of your own food. So whether that be meat or eggs, um, that's something that they can provide. Maybe you're looking to smart start a small business enterprise um, selling eggs or meat that's a way to do it the other thing is if you have kids uh, not only do chickens make a great 4-h project but they can also teach a few lessons out of that they can really provide where does your food come from which is always something that becomes a pretty hot topic with uh, youth today and then another thing would be that chickens don't really live that long and so getting to learn some of those natural cycles between birth and death and the other thing too is maybe you're a gardener and you're looking for a little bit more of soil health fertility just know that chicken manure is fantastic for fertilizer when it is composted down and can be applied to your garden so now this is a picture of just a whole bunch of different breeds out there. So make sure you're picking the breed that is right for you. So we are gonna discuss a few different breeds. We are gonna be talking about nowhere near all of them, um, but just know that there are many, many out there. They come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, we got a Bantam over here. We got a Pheasant down here, a Polish, some Silkies. All sorts of different breeds are out there and just pick what interests you and what's going to be the right fit. So before we even get into the different types of breeds, though, I want to talk about a few key points. So layers are used for egg production. That is what they're called. Broilers are meat birds specifically used for meat. Um, a dual purpose animal is used for both meat and eggs. An ornamental is going to be your exotic, your show birds. So that could be whether it's a peacock or a quail or a pheasant, you know, like all of those things technically classify under that. And then your bantams are a chicken, but they're a quarter of the size of the other. So I have this really interesting picture here on the screen that I just wanted to highlight. So here we have some geese eggs. And then a little bit smaller, we have duck, followed over here by your standard chicken egg. And then you have a bantam, which are going to be a little bit smaller because they are a smaller bird. And then over here, you have your smallest one, which is going to be a quail. So just know that there's varying in sizes and colors just based upon the type of bird that you have and even upon the breed, right? Because these are both chicken eggs, there is that variability. So let's talk about layers first. So have you ever gone to the grocery store and you see those eggs and right there's the white eggs and there's the brown eggs at the grocery store and you go oh well everyone told me that the brown eggs are healthier so I'm gonna get those. 
I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Um, the eggshell has zero determination upon the actual nutritional value of the egg. It all comes down to what the hen has actually eaten in her diet, not the shell color. That is completely a myth. Um, just know that there are differences within the breeds. So again, here I have this picture. So we have the white guys over here, which are your leghorns. And these guys, um, they lay the white eggs. So usually if you're going to go to the grocery store and buy a white egg, they're probably going to come from these guys. Um, the other thing would be as to why you would have that is, so if you go to the grocery store and you have your white eggs and your brown eggs, for some reason, they don't actually know why, but it's been scientifically proven that the white egg layers are have a higher feed efficiency value than the brown shell layers. They haven't been able to figure out why, but it is true. And then the other thing about that is the white eggs are actually easier to candle. So candling is when you hold a light to it and you can look in this egg and determine grade. You can also determine um, if it's fertilized or not. And so that is a lot of the time why you're going to have just between the prolific of the bird and then because of the color of the shell. And just know, right, so down here I have the green Easter eggs are Americanas. So that's a specific type of breed. So this is what the chicken itself looks like. And those are the ones that lay these green eggs, which is really kind of fun and different. But just know that there are those differences. So getting into leghorns, like I said, these guys are prolific layers and they lay white shells. So these guys, like I said, if you're going to go to the grocery store and buy eggs and they're white, probably coming from these guys, they are the most numerous breed that is out there today just because of how efficient they are at laying eggs. Um, these guys can be a little bit high strung, but the other thing that's good to know about them is they're good foragers and they will rarely go broody. And what I mean by that is if you down the road have a hen and a rooster and you want to hatch out some chicks, um, these are not the guys to do it. You might have a clutch of eggs, right? You want the hen to come sit on them. These guys are not really going to go down that route. So just something to keep in mind. Next up, we have the buff Orpington. Um, so something to say about this is buff is referring to the color. The Orpington species, they have a whole bunch of different colors that actually they can come in. I just happen to choose this specific color for this example. Um, these guys are good foragers. Can't, they have pretty good feather coverage, so are actually pretty good at enduring cold temperatures. The other thing that's unique about them is their dual purpose, so good for both meat and eggs. And these guys will lay a brown egg. And these guys can go broody, and if they do hatch out a clutch of eggs, are usually pretty good mothers. And for the most part, are really pretty docile birds. Next up, we have the Plymouth Roth or the Bard Rock. So these guys are actually, it's the same name for the same guys. I don't know why. It just is what it is. But these guys are pretty good all around chicken. They're docile. They do come in many different color combinations. Um, they do get a little bit broody, but, um, you know, they're being relatively docile, that's not really going to be a problem. They are good mothers and they tame really quite easily. So the more you handle them, the tamer they're going to be. And right, you, if you have a little kid, you can pick them up and kind of carry them around. That's typically what they're known for. Now, these guys, I would say, are probably one of my favorite just because they are so good at laying eggs. Um, so these are called the Rhode Island Red. Um, these are really great choice for people with a small flock because you're going to get that egg production. The other thing about it is that they are really pretty good about handling poor conditions for housing and marginal diets. So they're really pretty hardy and can do their thing. Something to note is the roosters may be aggressive. That's something to note. Um, and the hens may show some broodiness, but they're really a pretty good overall bird. Okay, now I want to get into sex link hybrids. So these guys are going to be your egg production birds, and they're going to be crosses between some. So in here, I have golden comet chicks, which, for example, are going to be a cross between a Rhode Island red and a white leghorn. 
Um, and there's a couple other crosses here. But the thing that's unique about these guys is, right, you're taking the best of each bird and kind of putting them together. But then the other part about it, as you can see from this picture, is you have varying in colors. So instead of getting a straight run group of chicks, which is both males and females, you just don't really know what you're going to get. Oh, geez, what am I doing here? You're able to pick out specifically as what you want. So if you want hens, you can tell immediately at birth which ones are the males and which ones are the females. So you can get them ordered that way. So the females have this darker coloring on them and a stripe down their back, whereas the males are going to be this lighter yellow color. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but they have a marked of the differences. Okay, so now let's get into broilers. So broilers are bred specifically for meat production. They can lay eggs, but that's really not what their talent is. Um, they are specifically bred for meat production. So they are usually crosses between other bird species that they have noticed have put on great weight within a short period of time and they have been purpose bred to continue that down the line here. So they are very fast growing but just know that it is to a fault. Um, sometimes they can potentially grow too big too fast which can lead to both leg and heart problems but this can be managed with proper feeding. The other thing that I want to note about broilers is when you're getting broilers you want to focus on getting them when you want to process them. So, right, if you're thinking about getting laying chicks, you want to think about like, okay, I want to get them in, let's just say, April. I want to get them in April. They're going to grow. I know about when they're going to be doing their stuff, right? For broilers, it's not so much of when you're getting them in. It's like, okay, I want to process chickens on, for example, May 15th. So, you know, you need to be getting them in that time frame before so they have enough time to put their weight on. So Cornish cross meat birds are going to be your most predominant meat birds that you're going to find. So those guys look, this is what they look like, right? Okay. So these are considered like the ultimate meat bird. If you go to the store and you buy a rotisserie chicken, almost guarantee that's going to be what it is. These guys have excellent carcass shape and they grow really pretty fast. They will say they are not foragers though. You really need to supply all their food for them and they just want to eat. They just want to stay at the feeder and eat, which can be a problem, but we'll get to that later. Um, but just know that these guys can produce five to six pounds of carcass in as little as six to eight weeks. So that's really not a lot of time. Okay, these guys are called red rangers, so another meat bird. The difference between these guys is they're a little bit slower growing than the Cornish crosses. It takes about 10 to 12 weeks to get four to five pounds. So the thing that's different about these guys, other than the feather color, is these guys are predominantly putting on leg muscle. So what your dark meat is. Whereas if you look at the shape of these Cornish crosses, these guys are specifically known for having large breasts. So they have a lot of white meat. All right, so ornamentals, these are going to be all your kind of show birds, whether it be peacocks, geese, ducks, pheasants, whatever else have you. But just know that those are going to be there if you're flipping through the catalog. They, they are in there. Okay, so you've picked your breeds. Now what? You need to order them. And something to be mindful of when you're ordering your chicks is expect there to be losses. So if you're like, I want six chickens, Order more because you can expect that there are going to be losses. It's just kind of how it works. Um, you can do everything right and still one of them's going to get sick or it's just going to be low man on the totem pole. It just kind of happens. So expect those losses. But then the other thing to do is prep. Um, you need to be ready for both stages of life. A baby chick and an adult chicken have very different needs, and you need to be ready for both stages of those. Because, right, they grow relatively fast because they have a short lifespan. So something else that can be considered when you're ordering your chick is that there are different diseases that you can vaccinate against. So one of them is Merrick's disease. And this is a herpes virus. 
that is very prolific in chickens. It's not the same kind of herpes virus that you would think of, and it's not contagious to people. Um, this is typically known to be pretty deadly in chickens. And the reason is, is it causes paralysis, as you can see in this picture here. And it's usually the fact that they can't move, so they can't eat or drink. And that's usually what ends up killing the bird. Um, there is no treatment for this, only prevention. So this is why I'm really going to highly encourage you to vaccinate at the hatchery. The other thing that's really pretty common is coccidiosis. You can also vaccinate for this. This one's not necessarily that you have to. Um, you can use medicated feed to combat th this, which is called a coccidiostat. Um, but for this, for symptoms to look for is the chicks will usually be between one and four weeks old, and they will usually get diarrhea. And it's usually from that that they're going to end up dying because of dehydration. And what coccidiosis is, is a microscopic parasite that infests the intestines. Um, I believe that, I mean, don't quote me on that, but usually vaccinating your chicks is going to be around like a quarter a piece. So it really doesn't cost that much and it's really gonna be a bigger benefit for you in the long run. So I'm going to really highly encourage that you do that. Um, the other thing to do is avoid other diseases. And to do that is really to keep their environment clean. So make sure it's clean and dry so you're not trying to encourage the growth of other bacteria or diseases within the area. Uh, make sure they have fresh air so they're not getting uh, having problems from the ammonia, make sure they have clean, fresh water and food, and then access to sunshine. And so if you can try and maintain all of these, you should have a relatively low death loss. Um, even if you do everything right, though, there are still a few conditions that you should probably watch out for in your chicks. Um, this is a picture here of pasted vent, and this is where the fecal material, so pasted vent, vent is where all of the fecal material comes out of as long as well as an egg in a chicken. It's the same location. So this usually comes from dehydration and the fecal matter gets stuck there on the vent and it can block up so that they cannot expel the feces and that can really do them in. So you can take care of this. What you can do is if you notice this happening is you can very gently do not use soap but use uh, warm water and gently rub it off and then make sure the chick is able to properly dry. The other thing that you might uh, see and notice is cannibalism or feather picking, which um, can be caused by a few different things. One of them would be there's not enough space for each chick. Sometimes they're honestly just bored. There could be that they're trying to establish a pecking order. Um, maybe they're trying to mate. Uh, the other thing could be a methionine deficiency. And so that's something that is in feathers. So if they're doing that, they could be looking for trying to get that, get up on that deficiency by eating, essentially eating the other feathers off the others. So let's talk about chick housing. So that's what you call a brooder. Um, so every chick is going to require water, feed, heat, light, ventilation, and space. So this is a picture of actually some of chicks that I have had in the past, right? So here we have a heat lamp. It's their heat source. They've got their fresh bedding. Um, there's plenty of ventilation going on. You can see there's adequate space for them to spread out. You can't see the full thing in the picture. And the water's not in there, but then you have access to feed. The one thing that I will say, so I'll show you a picture of it down the way, but here's also a feeder. This is like the same concept. It's a little bit different design, but same concept. So if you have that, sometimes these little guys might not be able to reach the feed. So what I actually, this one was a slide top. I actually have slid the top off and yeah, it's maybe not the most sanitary for them to be able to jump in there, right? But they're able to access it without any issue. Um, the other thing is make sure you have soft bedding. Use wood shavings. It is the best. It's easiest to clean. You kind of get that little dust bath action. They really do well within that. The other thing to do, as you can see in this picture, I have some insulation there, and that is to help combat drafts. So the other thing to think about with that is make sure you have it in a space that you know isn't going to be drafty. So you can laugh if you want to, but actually, so what I have here for a brooder is a water tank, right, that I would use for my cattle, clean, clean, 
dry water tank. And then I have the wood shavings in there, the heat lamp. There is a thermometer so we can regulate that. And then I have this insulation around there to keep the draft out. But the other thing is it's actually in my basement. And I have that because I know that the temperature is regulated in there and I know that they're safe and that there's not gonna be any strange draft coming in that can jeopardize the health of my chicks. Um, so something else to consider though about this is a chick requires about half a square foot of space and that's per chick. So that's just something really important to remember. The other thing that is super, super important here is temperature control. Keeping them warm is essential. Um, you need to have a heat lamp that's available to be able to raise and lower as you need it so you can really regulate that temperature where it needs to sit. Um, sometimes too with those heat lamps you can get a red light bulb and that can help with the feather pecking problems if you're having it because they can't really see each other as well. Um, just a little tip there. But so when you first get your chicks the temperature should be around 105 degrees and that should be lowered to 95 degrees over the period of the next few hours. So that is your ideal range. And that first week that you have your chicks you want it to be 90 to 95 degrees. And then as the weeks go on you're going to progressively raise your heat lamp so you're lowering that temperature it's not as direct on them and you're aiming for about 70 degrees by week five and after that you want to start weaning them from supplemental heat. So now everyone's everyone knows the stories of Goldilocks and the three bears and this is pretty much the same concept not too hot not too cold and just right. So in these diagrams here, the orange circle is going to be the heat lamp, and then we have the chicks around it. So if they're all huddled right around the light, it's too cold. If this is a lamp and they're all as far away from it as they can be, it's too hot. The other thing is if you have a draft, they're all going to be hanging out on one side. So right, this one, your draft is likely coming in, blowing this direction. And so it's cold and drafty in here, so they're hanging out on this side to avoid that. So you can tell that it's just right when they're scattered evenly throughout the entire space. Um, the other thing to think about here though is like you're really analyzing their body language for this and just know that that is one of your biggest tools in making sure that your chicks are where they should be. The other thing too is know that quiet chicks are happy chicks. If they're making a lot of noise, something's probably up. So here are some options on feed and watering equipment, right? Here is like that one that I showed you in the picture that I said of mine. Um, here's the cover of that. And as they get a little bit older, you can put the cover on. But when they're little like that, I like to have it off just so they I know that they're able to access everything freely. This is also a gravity feeder. So what you can do is you can hang this and you fill it and as the chickens eat gravity is coming in and filling that and so it just provides a little bit more than this would be. The other thing here so this is a water um, for this one you can see that there's this cord here meaning that it's electric so in a really cold climate this can be something that is really really nice because you don't have to worry about your waters freezing um, but just know that it's not required. The other thing that I will note that's pretty nice about this is how they have it off the ground. Sometimes you'll notice if you don't have it up off something and you'll notice this when the chicks are still quite little and you're really trying to make sure they have access is they'll end up kicking some of those wood shavings in there and it gets clogged in there and it's super frustrating. So as they get to be adult stage and a little bit older you can elevate it to prevent that a little bit but while they're super little just make sure that they have that access. It's better to endure than to um, make sure that, or instead of make sure, it's better to endure than to not let them have access to clean water, okay? So the first day you get your chicks now. Super exciting, fantastic. You went and picked them up or they showed up in the mail, whatever. The very first and foremost thing that you should be doing is taking each chick out individually and dipping their beak in the water. A lot of the times when you first get them, these chicks don't know how to drink. And obviously water is essential to living. So teach them how to drink, where it's at, that's important. The other thing that I like to do is I also like to dunk their head in the feed just so that I know that they know where it is. 
Um, so think that about one gallon water typically services 25 chicks and a one foot feeder is usually enough for 25 chicks as well. Um, one other tip about this, everyone knows the expression like, oh, you bird brain, right? Saying like you don't have a lot going on upstairs. That essentially can be really true. So when it comes to the water and whatnot, make sure that you're not leaving your water directly underneath the heat lamp. Um, a lot of the times those chicks can go to congregate for heat and in the process, they may drown themselves. Um, it's just unfortunate and it happens but avoid if you avoid putting it under the light you have a better success rate with that okay um, animal needs so just like every other animal whether it be human a cow a sheep a goat whatever every animal has specific nutrient requirements so energy which is going to be supplied by your carbohydrates proteins vitamins minerals and water and so there are different stages that you're feeding for so there's growth maintenance and reproduction if you're reading the ingredient analysis on your feed you should know what you're feeding how much of things you're feeding, and for what stage typically they'll have it advertised. So the other thing to think about is that chickens are omnivores. So not only will they eat your corn, but they're also gonna eat maybe a grasshopper or a frog. Maybe there's a mouse running around. Um, that's something to keep in mind. So if you wanna let your chickens out in free range, they will eat these things. But I also want you to know that you can't rely on them foraging to get that super balanced nutritional diet. You still need to be supplying that. Um, the other thing is, so the nutrient needs are going to vary between the age and stage of life of these chicks. So chicks are going to need a much higher protein than an adult will because they're growing and working on building muscle. Meat birds are going to need high protein and energy because they are just rapidly trying to build weight and put muscle on and they are just highly, highly efficient at that. Layers are going to need more calcium because they're sending out a lot of calcium in the eggshells. Um, the other thing to think about here of kind of things to supplement would be um, oyster shells. So if you, for example, you have layers and you pick them up after a while and you're like, oh my gosh, I pick it up and the shell just breaks. What that is indicating is that they are in a deficiency of calcium. So what you can do is supply some oyster shells within their feed to help boost that up. The other thing to think about is grit. So if you're not letting your chickens outside to roam, and even if you do, I still would probably suggest trying to supplement some grit in their diet. Um, this is so they can chew their food, right? Chickens have beaks. They don't have teeth. They don't get to chew it. So if they ingest a rock, some grit down, it goes into their gizzard. So when they eat, it goes there. And that essentially with muscle grinds everything so that it's able to continue down through the digestive system and they're able to utilize all those nutrients. The other thing to think about is colder weather is going to increase nutritional requirements because as you're burning more energy trying to stay warm, you're going to need to supply more energy in the diet. There are many different types of feeds out there. So you have conventional, you have non-GMO, you have transitional, and you have organic feed. Um, note that all organic feed is required to follow the organic standards, and those are listed here. And minerals and vitamins and everything else have to be FDA approved and listed on the AFCO label. Um, and it must be made with 100% grains and forages that are organic, handled, processed, grown, whole nine yards. Um, Non-GMO have non-genetically modified organisms in them, and conventional would be like your conventional corn that you would think of. The other thing that I want to talk about is um, you, sometimes you go to the grocery store and it says like, oh, no added hormones on the chicken. No chicken feed has added hormones, so that's not really something that you need to be worrying about. Um, so just remember that. And then the other thing, if we remember back to the diseases, we talked about the coccidiostat. Um, so that is when commercial feed can be purchased with or without medication. Um, so just what are your needs and what are you looking for? But overall, in general, of whatever you are picking out, just make sure you're looking at your label. 
Something else that can get confusing is the texture. So you like you overhear someone ordering like, oh, I want uh, I want a crumble feed. Okay, well, what is that? So here is a picture that really breaks that down. So you have your mash, your crumble, and your pellets, right? So um, your mash is going to be your most finest texture, and that you're likely going to be feeding to your your fresh chicks, and that's because they're little, so they they're not going to be able to swallow this, right? So as they get a little bit older and grow, you can progressively work them up to crumble, but usually adults are only going to be fed that pellet feed, or that would be my recommendation. So for layer feeding, just know that there are three like three traditional phases within a layer program. So you are looking for slower growth, you need less protein, and you're designed for egg production. So your starter grower is going to be 0 to 14 weeks, and for that you're going to want to look for 18 to 20% protein. Your pullet developer is around 14 to 20 weeks of age, and you want 14 to 16% protein. And then layer is they're fully mature here, and that's going to be 20 plus weeks, and you want 16 to 18% protein. Um, when it comes to how much feed are you going to need, you're typically going to want 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 pounds a day per bird to meet these requirements. Again, this can vary based upon weather and upon breed. Now, broilers are a little less tricky. They're not quite as much. So from zero to three weeks, you're going to be on 20 to 24% protein. And then at age about three weeks, you need to start implementing like 12 hours on and 12 hours off of feed. So do if we think back and we remember to me saying that um, broilers can have leg and heart issues. So a lot of this comes to from them wanting to eat too much feed. Okay, so if that is the case, if that is the case, oh my goodness, what is happening? If they're putting on too much weight, they can eventually get their body is too big for their legs and they can end up where they can't support themselves. So their legs will basically give out. Um, the other thing too that can happen is you can end up with heart issues because they've got put on so much weight so fast and they've gotten too fat almost that they basically go into heart failure and they can die that way. So that's something to be really cognizant about. Um, and then from three weeks to processing, you're gonna want 18 to 20% protein until you butcher. Now, housing is a fun little way to look at chickens because if you can imagine it, you can and you can build it, that can be your coop. There isn't any like sort of exact requirements or anything behind this. So just know that your housing is for providing protection from the elements and predators, providing some comfort. Ideally, you'd want some natural light in there, so a window like we have here. Um, good ventilation, whether that be natural or electric, so that way you can kind of see that there, so that way there's not going to be a buildup of ammonia in there that can be detrimental to your overall chicken health. And the other thing that is not required but can be helpful is electricity. Now, the thing I wanted to highlight about this one that's really pretty nice is, yep, they have the window to provide that natural light. And then the other thing is you can see they have their nest box here, which kind of jet out to the outside. So all you have to do is lift that up and then you can pick your eggs right there. You don't even have to go inside. That's kind of nifty. So there are a few different requirements to keep in mind here. So remember... It was about half a square foot per chick. Well, now that they've grown up and they're full-size chickens, you want four to five square feet per adult. That's a significant difference. And that's why I say you need to be considering both stages of life when you get those chicks because you want to make sure that you're going to have enough space for all of them when they get to that adult stage. So you are going to need a feeding area with natural light if possible, a roosting area for them to sleep. You can see I have some here, and that's how they like to sleep. Um, a dust bath, which is optional. That's how they like to bathe. A nest. You can't see it, but my nest boxes are here. I've got another little roost for them there. 
Um, and in that, you're going to really want to bed it up. So whether you're putting straw or wood shavings, corn cobs, something like that, which is a nice, warm, and inviting place for them to go lay their eggs. And then something to consider is you want about one nest box for every four chickens. So egg production. So your pullets, so your, your young layers, are typically going to start laying between five to six months. Um, so these, this is a picture of some pullet eggs next to a regular size egg. Um, you can see that they're going to be a little bit smaller. So that's, that's normal for the first couple eggs. They are going to be smaller because their bodies just get used to it and putting that out. So don't be alarmed. Um, so a chicken also has their highest productivity rate up to two years of age. And after about year three, that really starts to drop off. So that's what I mean by that really pretty short life cycle, um, because you're not necessarily going to want them if you're really looking for egg production to be around after year three. And also take in mind that it takes about 24 to 26 hours for a chicken to produce an egg. So it's typically about one a day. And you should also consider that, so I have a picture of a rooster over here. You don't need a rooster if you don't want one. So if you are interested in having fertilized eggs, yes, absolutely, go ahead and get a rooster. Um, you want an alarm clock? Sure, get a rooster. But just know that you don't have to have one to have chickens. Um, the other thing about egg production here is, so your layers, I kind of mentioned on this, are going to need more minerals, so more calcium in their diet, right? So feed that oyster shells for that calcium source. And just know that you can buy these complete feeds. So if you're buying a complete feed, it takes the complete guesswork out of it. You're getting all the nutrients that you need. You don't have to think about it all. You can also buy rations and create your own feed, and that's kind of putting it all together like a recipe. But just remember those specific requirements that we talked about earlier are what you're gonna to wanna to make sure is supplied within the diet. So now we're on to light considerations. So the amount of chicken, the amount of light a chicken receives directly affects its egg productivity. I won't bore you with the, the super specifics of it, but basically chickens can see in the four wavelengths, whereas humans see in three. And it's actually that fourth wavelength that stimulates the reproductive cycle in the brain with that UV light. And this gets the track and everything ro rocking and rolling. So your hens are typically gonna produce more eggs in the spring and summer when you have more sunlight and that's going to start dropping off in the fall and winter because obviously there's less sunlight. Um, the highest productivity of a chicken is usually about 16 hours of light and then you have that natural slowdown as that goes as the hours of daylight decrease. If it's winter time though and you're looking to have more eggs, just know that you can compensate for this by providing artificial light. So what's recommended is an LED um, because it has high energy efficiency, it's long lasting, and it provides the full spectrum of light range to really stimulate those chickens. So again, it's touching on that UV for the chickens. Egg collection. So you should typically plan on collecting your eggs every single day. It's just good practice to be doing that. When you go and pick your eggs, the cleaner your nest box is, the cleaner your eggs are going to be. But just know that some of them may still have some manure on them. It's just kind of how it works. If you do decide to wash your eggs, though, do not use soap. Just use water and a soft brush only. So on this picture here, you can see this one. It's called the cuticle. So that is the outermost protective layer on an egg. So you don't even see that. It's a protective layer on the shell. And so when you wash the egg, you're actually washing off that protective layer, which is naturally antimicrobial. And so that's making the eggshell more porous and makes more opportunity for bacteria to invade. So if you wash an egg, you immediately need to put it in the refrigerator for storage. Um, but if you are storing them at room temperature because you have not washed them, you can do that, but it's not recommended for do to do it for any longer than two weeks. The other thing to think about is human safety and zoonotic diseases. Assume that all chickens are going to be carrying 
some diseases such as salmonella and campylobacteria. Um, so practice safe handling. If you're handling your chickens, make sure you wash your hands afterwards. Use hand sanitizer if you don't have the option to use soap and water. And let's plan on not letting the kids kiss the chickens, okay? <laughs> um, the other thing to think about, though, is like they may be able to give some diseases to us, but just know that other things in the area can give diseases to your chickens. So here is a whole list of them. I'm not really going to dive into the whole specifics and bore you with that. But one of them that I really want to highlight is HPAI or highly pathogenic avian influenza. That's been in the news quite a bit over the last few years. And that is something that has sped through spread through droppings. So whether you have like migrating geese coming over and dropping, um, that's something how that can spread. And it's, it's really pretty deadly to different birds. It's not good. And the other thing about that is making sure you have a good biosecurity plan in place to help prevent wildlife from coming in or potentially spreading this. So let's talk about biosecurity. Biosecurity is a set of measures or steps taken to prevent or reduce disease introduction through people, animals, environment, and vehicles. So I'm going to recommend that everyone have a biosecurity plan. So whether you have you keep your chickens isolated. You're not interacting with other different birds or other your neighbor's birds, really trying to keep your own flock your own. Um, you have a visitor policy. So whether that's they're stepping in a foot bath before they enter your coop to make sure they're not bringing anything in. You're cleaning and disinfecting everything. Um, I will say, like, don't borrow disease from your neighbors. Assume that your neighbor's flock has different diseases naturally than what your flock does. And if you're going to borrow a water, for example, from your neighbor, just assume that if you don't sanitize that properly and you give it to your chickens, you have now done that and introduced that to your flock. The other thing is control wildlife, birds, and other pests. So think about HPAI, right? As like I said, with the migrating geese. So whether that be you fence off a spot in the spring for your chickens and they can go outside, but you have netting over the top so wild birds are not coming and trying to eat the feed or you know, just different things like that. Or maybe you're keeping them cooped up so they're not interacting. Just different options. Just really try and have a plan in place. And here are some references. And here's my contact information if you have any questions. And as always, feel free to contact me with any questions that you may have. Thank you.